All right, Eagles, I hope you had a wonderful weekend and got caught up on Hatchet. And we are about halfway through, and today we're going to read Chapter 10. So just a quick recap. Remember, Brian has finally found food. He's got some raspberries. He's got his shelter. And last but not least, he finally has fire. So let's see what happens next. He could not at first leave the fire. It was so precious to him, so close and a sweet thing. The yellow and red flames brightening the dark interior of the shelter, the happy crackle of the dry wood as it burned, that he could not leave it. He went to the trees and brought in as many dead limbs as he could chop off and carry. And when he had a large pile of them, he sat near the fire. Though it was getting into the warmth middle part of the day, and he was hot, and he broke them into small pieces and fed the fire. I will not let you go out, he said to himself, to the flames, not ever. And so he sat through a long part of the day, keeping the flames even, eating from his stock of raspberries, and leaving to drink from the lake when he was thirsty. In the afternoon, toward evening, with his face smoke-smeared and his skin red from the heat, he finally began to think ahead to what he needed to do. He would need a large wood pile to get through the night. It would be almost impossible to find wood in the dark, so he had to have it all in and cut and stacked before the sun went down. Brian made certain the fire was banked with new wood, then went out of the shelter and searched for a good fuel supply. Up the hill from the campsite, the same windstorm that left him a place to land the plane. Had that only been there four days ago? Had dropped three large white pines across each other. They were dead now, dry and filled with weathered, dry, dead limbs. Enough for many days. He chopped and broke and carried wood back to the camp, stacking the pieces under the overhang until he had what he thought to be an enormous pile, as high as his head and six feet across the base. Between trips, he added small pieces to the fire to keep it going, and on one of the trips to get wood, he noticed an added advantage of the fire. When he was in the shade of the trees, breaking limbs, the mosquitoes swarmed him, as usual. But when he came to the fire, or just near the shelter where the smoke edited and swirled, the insects were gone. It was a wonderful discovery. The mosquitoes had nearly driven him mad, and the thought of being rid of them lifted his spirits. On another trip, he looked back and saw the smoke curling up through the trees and realized for the first time that he now had a means to make a signal. He could carry a burning stick and build a signal fire on top of the rock, make clouds of smoke, and perhaps attract attention, which meant more wood, and still more wood. There did not seem to be an end to the wood he would need, and he spent all the rest of the afternoon into dusk making wood trips. At dark, he settled in again for the night, next to the fire with the stack of short pieces ready to put on, and he ate the rest of the raspberries. During all the work of the day, his leg had loosened, but still ached a bit, and he rubbed it and watched the fire, and thought for the first time since the crash that he might be able, he might be getting a handle on things, might be starting to do something other than just sit. He was out of food, but he could look tomorrow, and he could build a signal fire tomorrow, and get more wood tomorrow. The fire cut the night coolness and settled him back into sleep, thinking of tomorrow. He slept hard, and wasn't sure what awakened him, but his eyes came open, and he stared into the darkness. The fire had burned down, and looked out, but he stirred with a piece of wood and found a bed of coals still glowing hot and red. With small pieces of wood and carefully blowing, he soon had the blaze going again. It had been close. He had to be sure to try and sleep in short intervals so that he could keep the fire going. And he tried to think of a way to regulate his sleep, but it made him sleepy to think about it, and he was just going under again when he heard the sound outside. 
It was not unlike the sound of the porcupine, something slithering and being dragged across the sand. But when he looked out the door opening, it was too dark to see anything. Whatever it was, stopped making that sound in a few moments. And he thought he heard something sloshing into the water at the shoreline. But he had the fire now and plenty of wood, so he wasn't as worried as he had been the night before. He dozed and slept for a time, awakened again just at the dawn gray light, and added wood to the still smoking fire before standing outside and stretching, standing with his arms stretched over his head and the tight knot of hunger in his stomach. He looked towards the lake and saw the tracks. They were strange. A main center line from up the lake in the sand with claw marks to the side of it, leading to a small pile of sand and then going back down into the water. He walked over and squatted near them, studied them, tried to make sense of them. Whatever he had, whatever had made the tracks, had some kind of flat, dragging bottom in the middle and was apparently pushed along by the legs that stuck out to the side. Up from the water to a small pile of sand, then back down into the water. Hmm, some animal. Some kind of water animal that came up to the sand to... To do what? To do something with the sand? To play and make a pile in the sand? He smiled. City boy, he thought. Oh, you city boy with your city ways. He made a mirror in his mind. A mirror of himself and saw how he must look. City boy with your city ways, sitting in the sand, trying to read tracks, not knowing, not understanding. Why would anything wild come up from the water to play in the sand? Not that way. Animals weren't that way. They didn't waste time that way. It had come up from the water for a reason. A good reason. And he must try to understand the reason. He must change to fully understand the reason himself. Or he would not make it. It had come up from the water. For a reason. And the reason, he thought, squatting the reason had to do with the pile of sand he brushed the top off gently with his hand and found only damp sand still there must be a reason and he carefully kept scraping and digging until about four inches down he suddenly came to a small chamber in the cool damp sand and there lay eggs many eggs almost perfectly round eggs the size of a table tennis ball. And he laughed, because he knew then. It had been a turtle. He had seen a show on television about sea turtles that came up onto beaches and laid their eggs in the sand. There must be a freshwater lake turtles that did the same. Maybe snapping turtles. He had heard of snapping turtles. They became fairly large, he thought. It must have been a snapper that came in in the night, and when he heard the noise that awakened him, she must have come then and laid the eggs. Food. More than eggs. More than knowledge. More than anything. This was food. His stomach tightened and rolled and made a noise as he looked at the eggs, as if his stomach belonged to somebody else or had seen the eggs with its own eyes and was demanding food. The hunger, always there, had been somewhat controlled and dormant when there was nothing to eat. Both the eggs came the scream to eat. His whole body craved food with such an intensity that it quickened his breath. He reached into the nest and pulled the eggs out one at a time. There were 17 of them, each as round as a ball and white. They had leathery shells and that gave instead of breaking when they squeezed. When he had them heaped on the sand in a pyramid, he had never felt so rich somehow. He suddenly realized that he did not know how to eat them. He had a fire, but no way to cook them, no container. He had never thought of eating a raw egg. He had an uncle named Carter, his brother, father's brother, who always put an egg in a glass of milk and drank it in the morning. Brian had watched him do this once, just once. And when the runny part of the white left the glass and went into his uncle's mouth and down his throat in a single gulp, Brian almost lost everything that he had ever eaten. Still, he thought. Still, 
his stomach moved towards the backbone and became less and less fussy. Some natives in the world ate grasshoppers and ants if they could, that he could also get a raw egg down. He picked one up and tried to break the shell, found it surprisingly tough. Finally, using the hatchet, he sharpened a stick and poked a hole in the egg. He widened the hole with his finger and looked inside. Just an egg. It had a dark yellow yolk and not so much white as he thought there would be. Just an egg. Food. Just an egg that he had to eat raw. He looked out across the lake and brought the egg to his mouth, closed his eyes and sucked and squeezed the egg at the same time and swallowed as fast as he could. <clears throat> he had a greasy, almost oily taste, but it was still an egg. His throat tried to throw it back up. His whole body seemed to convulse with it, but his stomach took it, held it, and demanded more. The second egg was easier. And by the third one, he had no trouble at all. It just slid right down. He ate six of them. Could have easily eaten all of them and not been full. But a part of him said to hold back and save the rest. He could not now believe the hunger. The eggs had awakened it fully, roaringly, so that it tore at him. And after the sixth egg, he ripped the shell open and licked the inside clean then went back and ripped the other five open and licked them out as well and wondered if he could eat the shells. There must be some food value in them, but when he tried, they were too leathery to chew and he couldn't get them down. He stood away from the eggs for a moment, literally stood and turned away so that he could not see them. If he looked at them, he would have to eat more. He would store them in the shelter and eat only one a day. He fought the hunger down again and controlled it. He would take them now and store them and save them and eat one a day. And he realized as he thought it had been forgotten that they might come. The searchers. Surely they would before he could eat all the eggs at one day. He had forgotten to think about them. And that wasn't good. He had to keep thinking of them because if he forgot them and did not think of them, they might forget about him. And he had to keep hoping. Had to keep hoping. Tune in for chapter 11 tomorrow.